title for tonight is, Does God Have a Father? In Deuteronomy 6, Moses declared, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. He called Israel to reject the false gods around them and worship the one true God. Today, God calls us to do the same thing. But how do we know what to believe about God? Are we free to just decide on our own? What part does the Bible play in our views? While Mormon leaders often like to portray their faith as merely another branch of Christianity, which unlike other churches preaches the entirety of Christ's gospel, most people are unaware how radically the Mormon view of God differs from the picture of God one finds in the Bible and traditional Christian theology. As we study the Bible, we find that God is revealed to us as one infinite eternal spirit from everlasting to everlasting, all-knowing, all-powerful, holy, and righteous. But these attributes carry different meanings within Mormonism. Let's look at God as creator. The Bible opens with a grand declaration, in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. Notice that God exists outside of his creation. In the beginning, God, singular. Well, Mormons want to make an issue over Elohim, but that's another topic. Elohim is a plural word meaning, um, well, it can be used different ways, but in this context, it's the majesty of the one almighty in charge of everything. And so um, I'm getting off on tangent. The point being that it's God that is mentioned, not a council of gods, not a whole bunch of people. God did not need to create the universe and man. He chose to do so. It is beyond our comprehension to understand such a creator. But as one person observed, as the one true self-existent God, his being is totally unique. The difference between the creator and human is so vast that he exists fundamentally as a different order of being. God essentially exists in an infinitely superior, stronger, more excellent way. It's as if one compared the sun to a candle the ocean to a raindrop, or the universe to the room we're sitting in. God reminds Job of the fine, infinite distance and imbalance between man and him, showing that the creator alone is unique. He states, where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand who marked off its dimensions. Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? Of course, this is all done facetiously. I mean, God doesn't expect him to say, oh, I know 3,000 gods did this. There is no imperfection or limitation to the creator. All else can pass away in an instant. God inevitably exists forever. The prophet Nehemiah declared, thou hast made heaven the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and all things that are therein, the seas and all that is therein, and thou preservest them all. Notice the repeated use of all, all the hosts, with all things, all that is therein, and God preserves them all. And that's the majesty you see throughout the Bible. Everything points to God singularly, and to everything else as being totally under God's control, all of everything. Isaiah declares in chapter 44 that everything in the universe came into being through and because of God's act of creation. He is the greatest, the first cause. The psalmist declares he is from everlasting to everlasting. And Jeremiah proclaims that he fills heaven and earth. From these and other such verses, we conclude that there is only one God whose existence is without beginning or end and is the creator of all that exists. Isaiah records God's words, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there's no God. 
And then he says, is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God, I know not any. And that's so important in the context of Mormonism. Yet Joseph Smith taught that there were countless gods. In 1844, he preached, I wish to declare I have always and in all congregations when I have preached on the subject of deity, it has been the plurality of gods. In the LDS temple ceremony is a reenactment of the creation and the first part of Genesis. While the Bible attributes creation to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Mormon temple ceremony portrays creation by the Father, Son, and Michael, who will later become Adam. While Smith insists that he always taught there was a plurality of gods, his earliest works do not reflect this. In the book of Moses, chapter 2, creation is told as the work of the Father and Son. But several years later, Smith started to expand on his ideas about deity. In later years, he wrote in chapter 4 of the book of Abraham, which was written a number of years after the other one, that the creation story was carried out by a council of gods. Quote, and then the Lord said, let us go down, and they went down at the beginning, and they, that is, the gods, organized and formed the heavens and the earth. Joseph Smith also taught in section 131 of the Doctrine and Covenants that the elements or matter are eternal. Quote, there is no such thing as immaterial matter all spirit is matter, but it is more fine or pure and can only be discerned by purer eyes. We cannot see it, but when our bodies are purified, we shall see that it is all matter. So you have this picture of some, what, holding place <laughs> somewhere in the outer space where there is this sea, an infinite supply of matter and intelligences that will someday be used by various gods to make their worlds. Smith also taught that man's spirit or intelligence is co-eternal with God. In section 93 of the Doctrine and Covenants we read, man was also in the beginning with God. Intelligence or the light of truth was not created or made, neither indeed can be. For man is spirit, the elements are eternal, and spirit and element inseparably connected receive the fullness of joy. Here again, this is pointing out this idea that each of us as an, an intelligence or the basic unit of us, our personality, our mind, has always existed. God did not create it. It exists outside of God. We all started someplace in, in this pool of intelligences, including our Heavenly Father. The LDS view of creation is not about God creating out of nothing, but God taking existing matter and intelligences and forming them into our world and mankind. Thus, Heavenly Father followed the same path as other gods did before him. And in their scriptures and in their temple ritual, uh, it talks about the many, many worlds that God had already created before ours and that he intended to create many more after that. And when you factor that in, that each of those worlds supposedly would have a certain number that would advance to godhood, like the Mormons expect those that fulfill everything here would someday be a god for their own world. You can imagine when you have all of these worlds that he's already created, how many gods that just in that sense would have been created. But if God was once as we are now, then that means there were his brothers probably that also became gods around the same time that he did. And out there somewhere would be other relatives of his that would be making all these worlds as well. Not just that, his mother and father would be out there making more worlds as well. So the concept of God, uh, of one God is totally foreign to the Mormon way of thinking. There are billions, in, an infinite number of gods out there already and more to come. The LDS view of creation is not about God creating out of nothing, but existing matter. In the Encyclopedia of Mormonism, this is point one, oh, pointer. I, somewhere I had one of those. Is that what this thing is? 
Okay, what do I do next? Aha! That's the right one, even. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> Just, okay, this is quoting from the Encyclopedia of Mormonism, which the articles in it were written <coughs> by BYU professors. Just as God organized pre-existing matter to create the universe, so organized pre-existing intelligence to create the spirits that eventually became human beings. Consequently, Latter-day Saints do not view God as the total cause of what human beings are, Human intelligence is uncreated by God and therefore independent of his control. So you see how far they have moved away from traditional view of one eternal God and the God portrayed in the Bible. Now many of your Mormon friends won't know these things because uh, like many Christians, they just go to church and take care of Sunday school or whatever and they don't study their own doctrines. But this is the theology that their leadership are all trained in. And if you were a regular temple worker in the bishopric or something like that, return missionaries, they usually understand these things. Although I find many of them still haven't thought the, the implications through very far. But so even if your neighbor says, I'm crazy, we don't believe that. <laughs> uh, when a Mormon says to me, I don't believe that, I say, well, that's great. I'm sure glad you don't. But what I don't understand is why you'd want to stay in a church where all your leaders believe that. So I don't try to make them say that they believe it. I say, just congratulate them. Good. Okay, from this quote we see, it would mean that there is an eternal supply of matter and intelligences from which each God draws in order to form his particular world. Yet in Psalms 33, we read, by the word of the Lord, the, hev the heavens were made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. God created the heavens and everything it is. And when it says everything, it means everything. I have Mormons say to me, oh, well, that's everything for our world, or that's everything for our universe or whatever. <laughs> you know, the meaning of everything means everything. <laughs> and when he uses all, he means all. <laughs> Not only did Joseph Smith teach that there are multiple gods, but that our Heavenly Father once lived as a human on another world. Obeying the decrees of the God in charge of that earth, he died, resurrected, and eventually achieved godhood. As a resurrected being, the Mormon Heavenly Father can only be in one place at one time. Yet Jeremiah records God as saying, can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him? saith the Lord. Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord. Jesus makes a similar point when he told the woman at the well that God is spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Another difference between standard Christianity and Mormonism is the LDS teaching that Heavenly Father was once a savior on another earth system. A lot of Mormons haven't picked this one up. <laughs> uh, so here's a quote from uh, Joseph Smith, and this is from Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith, a little book that you get at Deseret Bookstore. The son doeth what he hath seen the father do. Then the father hath some day laid down his life and taken it again. So he has a body of his own, speaking of Heavenly Father, that he has a resurrected body, because on some earth he was their savior. Uh, of course, that raises a question, then, do all of us have to be a savior <laughs> on some world? And they say no, but if, uh, well, if, that's, if Jesus did what his father did, then why aren't the rest of us doing what the father did? So I don't know how that quite follows. But anyways, Jesus became a savior because he saw the father be a savior. Two months before his death, Joseph Smith preached, God himself was once as we are now and is an exalted man and sits enthroned in yonder heavens. We have imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. I will refute that idea and take away the veil so that you may see he was once a man like us, yea, that God himself, the father of us all, dwelt on an earth the same as Jesus Christ himself did, and I will show it from the Bible. Here then is eternal life, 
to know the only wise and true God, and you have got to learn how to be gods yourselves and to be kings and priests to God, the same as all gods have done before you. And that's out of the history of the church, volume six. It's also in teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith. Uh, if you wanna read his, Joseph Smith's whole sermon on the nature of God, uh, if you go to the LDS website and go to the back issues of the Enzyme magazine, in the April and May issues of 1971, they printed his, what they refer to as the King Follett sermon. Uh, and it's not a sermon about a king. This guy by the name of King Follett died and these were remarks made in honoring him as a kind of funeral memorial service. But his doctrine of God is laid out there. Many times I find Mormons will tell me that all the other kind of statements I give on this are just people's opinion. And I say, yes, but when it comes to Joseph Smith, he's the one that's supposed to sing God and Jesus in the grove. And so I assume he knows pretty good what God's supposed to be like. So when he tells me these things in a sermon, that God became God, the same as we all can become gods, then I don't see how a Mormon can dismiss this. If Joseph Smith's wrong on the nature of God, why would I believe him on anything else? So if you want to read his whole sermon, you can go to the Enzyme and on their website and read it. I think every Mormon should read this. In fact, I challenge Mormons to read it when they come in the bookstore. Have you read Joseph Smith's Sermon on God? No? Okay, good. Read it and come back and talk to me. Think about this. If our God was once a mortal like us, was he also a sinner like us? If he never sinned, then he was not like us and achieved something we could never achieve. Many Mormons have not thought this one through either. Aaron that's doing the videoing tonight, uh, he's at the back, raise your hand, that's Aaron. He, I talked to him afterwards, he's done videos that are posted on the internet that are fascinating where he goes down to Temple Square and has interviewed different Mormons about this very topic of has God sinned? Could God have sinned? How would you feel about it if God had sinned? And I was amazed in watching different ones of these, how many young people even conceded that yes, he could have sinned, that that would not affect their view of God to think of him as once being a sinful man. And they have to arrive at that because otherwise how are they going to hope to become a God? Because they have been sinful. There isn't a single Mormon that hasn't committed at least one sin. And yet they hope to become gods. Well, then it follows, if we're doing what God did, God could have been a sinner as well. Joseph Fielding Smith, the 10th president of the LDS Church and nephew of Joseph Smith, explained that there were gods prior to our Heavenly Father achieving godhood. And this is PowerPoint 2. Dwight. Well, I don't know what to do. Okay. Well, it should say our father. Yeah. Thank you. I'm technically challenged. <laughs> I, I can run my computer, sort of. <laughs> okay. Here's a quote from Joseph Fielding Smith, nephew of Joseph Smith. Our father in heaven, according to the prophet, had a father, and since there has been a condition of this kind through all eternity, each father had a father until we come to a stop where we cannot go further because of our limited capacity to understand. Do you see how this from a Christian perspective, is very demeaning to the whole concept of the Christian God. Yet the uh, God of the Bible has no equal. Paul wrote in Romans, for who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. 
Often if you ask a Mormon if he believes in multiple gods or suggests that Mormonism is polytheistic, he will answer that he, he only believes in one God, his heavenly father. Yet if pressed, he will usually concede that there are other deities, but he only prays to one God, the God who created this earth. And then we have a discussion about when uh, we read in Isaiah that uh, before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me, I am the Lord, and beside me there's no Savior. That doesn't just mean for our earth. So when you see all or the only one, that's what it means. There aren't any other gods, he's the only one, and, and yet they want to qualify it all by saying, well, that's for this earth. It doesn't, I guess it doesn't count for Pluto, but, uh, but according to Mormonism, all of these uh, galaxies out there already have existing gods and people going through earth life as we are doing all sorts of different gods, gods that are the sons, grandfathers, uncles, father-in-laws, of all the people from different worlds that have made it to godhood, spread out through all the galaxies of the universe. And by the way, that's why some Mormons I meet believe in flying saucers, <laughs> because they believe there's these other worlds that are further along than us, and so that's just flying saucer people, that's uh, some other god out there. Okay, well, I, I just figure if they're out there, they must be friendly, or they would have blown us up by now. Mormonism is not saying men can ever be equal to or progress beyond Heavenly Father. They view it more like an escalator of God's eternally moving up, becoming more powerful as each oversees his posterity below him. So they believe we will always worship our God, but he in turn worships the God above him. So think of the escalator. Heavenly Father gets on, he's raising up. Jesus gets on, he's raising up. One of the Mormon leaders gets on, he's raising up. And as they go up this eternal escalator of uh, godhood, they become more powerful as they oversee their posterity underneath them. So there is no one God that is in control of everything. And more uh, different people, a lot of... Non-Mormons moving in the state, when I talk to them about this, they will ask, well, well, then you've got to get back to the first one. If every God's got a mom and dad, well, then who's the first one? And I said, well, you missed the point where I said they have an infinite number of gods <laughs> doing this. As far back as you could go, there would be gods in process, their sons in process of becoming gods. So they don't have a first cause. They can't explain a first god. It's just not within their theology. Um, I think that's a logical problem, but anyways, they, they don't deal with it. It's, that's okay with them. Mormonism uh, doesn't stress the doctrine of uh, the multiple gods as much as they have in the past, but it still continues to teach that God has not always been God, but achieved that status in the distant past. In their 2002 teaching manual, Gospel Fundamentals, we read, it will help us to remember that our Father in heaven was once a man who lived on an earth the same as we do. He became our Father in heaven by overcoming problems, just as we have to do on this earth. And Gospel Fundamentals is different than the little pamphlet a lot of us are familiar with, Gospel Principles. And it's interesting, Gospel Fundamentals seems to be a manual they use a lot in uh, Europe and in the East, and I'm not sure why. It's a, I don't know if it's been vetted for not as much American sounding stuff or something, but uh, it's been translated into all kinds of languages in the East, but they don't translate it into Spanish, which I think is funny. Anyways, so, so there must be a difference, but I've never taken the time to read through them to figure out, okay, how come the Spanish get gospel principles and Europe gets gospel fundamentals? Anyways, but it's, it's right there. I just bought this book last week. It's currently in print at the distribution center where it says, Our Father in Heaven was once a man who lived on an earth the same as we do. So it is current theology. 
Here we see the basic contrast between LDS views of God and standard Christianity. Did God arrive at Godhood by obedience to laws already in place? Or has he eternally existed and is the source of all law? So you gotta think about that one. If God got to be God because of obedience, then he's answerable to a higher power. And if every God it gets to be a God because of obedience, where does that end? Where does it start? Uh, who set up the laws? In 1985, LDS apostle Bruce R. McConkie explained that when our Heavenly Father was a mortal prior to achieving Godhood, he successfully obeyed all the requirements to achieve exaltation. And this is PowerPoint 3. That's going to start. The Father is a glorified. There we go. The Father is a glorified, perfected, resurrected, exalted man who worked out his salvation by obedience to the same laws he has given us so that we may do the same. How are we to understand these terms? If God is glorified, there was a time when he was not. If he is perfected, then there was a time when he was not perfect. If he worked out his salvation by obedience, he was once not saved. His obedience would have been achieved while he was a mortal under the jurisdiction of a higher deity. The laws he obeyed would not be ones of his making. They were already in place. Okay, next PowerPoint, number four, eternal life. Yeah. Eternal life, oh, this is the 2011 LDS teaching manual called Teachings of the Presidents of the Church, George Albert Smith. Very current manual, 2011. Eternal life is to us the sum of pre-existence, present existence, and the continuation of life in immortality holding out to us the power of endless progression and increase. With that feeling and that assurance, we believe that as man is, God once was, and as God is, man may become. Being created in the image of God, we believe that it is not improper, that it is not unrighteous for us to hope that we may be permitted to partake of the attributes of deity, and if we are faithful, to become like unto God. Those of us that were, grew up in Mormonism grew up hearing this phrase, as man is, God once was, as God is, men may become. Uh, it's a statement made by one of their past prophets, Lorenzo Snow. When I was a teenager in Mormonism in Southern California, uh, this was something I had heard over and over again. But back in the 50s, they used it a lot. And since then, it's not put in the manuals as often, but it's still there, like it is in this statement here. When I was a teenager, a little Christian girl came up to me one day and asked me what the Mormons believed about God. And not knowing what to tell her, I thought of this little phrase. And I thought, oh, I know this one. <laughs> as man is, God once was, and as God is, man may become. And I was so proud, I remembered it. <laughs> And she looked at me horrified and she said, Sandra, that's blasphemy, and walked away. <laughs> and I'm standing there, well, it sounded good to me, you know. And I didn't know what her problem was. It, it took me a few, few years to work that one out. <laughs> but the amazing thing is that she understood it. <laughs> uh, so when we look at this statement, where in the Bible do we see this type of teaching, or the Book of Mormon for that matter, that states that God the Father was once a mortal man on some other world who progressed to godhood, or that sinful men can advance to godhood and oversee worlds of their own? By the way, the Book of Mormon doesn't teach most Mormon doctrine. It would be closer to the Bible than it would be to the Doctrine and Covenants which I find curious that the Mormon missionaries go out to the homes and want people to read the Book of Mormon and pray out about it, 
And I've asked different ones, why don't you give them the Doctrine and Covenants to read and pray about? Oh, well, they can have meat before, uh, milk before meat, and you start on the easy stuff. Well, what it really amounts to, it sounds the most like the Bible of anything they have, so they start there and then gradually indoctrinate you into the other books. But it's curious that the Book of Mormon does not teach eternal progression. It teaches there's only one God, that the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are one God. In fact, uh, one of the papers over there is uh, on contradictions between the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants, uh, because Joseph Smith's theology changed through the years. He starts off with teaching just one God, and over 14 years that evolves into this, uh, the, all these things we've been reading about, about the many gods and how they achieve it. Another quote, from, uh, this is from Joseph F. Smith. One of the things you find in studying Mormon history is they got all kind of same names. And so you have Joseph Smith, then you have Joseph F. Smith, who's his uh, nephew, and then you have Joseph Fielding Smith, who is uh, Joseph F. Smith's son, and then you have a, um, oh, oh, there's another one, uh, Fielding Smith. Yeah. Yeah, so you go on, it, so when you research this, I have people write little tracks and stuff, and they'll send them for me to review, and they got all these statements by Joseph Smith, and I have to tell them, you're going to have to sort out these guys. They aren't all the same person. <laughs> so your homework assignment is go figure out which Joseph Smith said it. <clears throat> okay, Joseph F. Smith, who was president of the church back around 1900, we are precisely in the same condition and under the same circumstances that God our Heavenly Father was when he was passing through this or a similar ordeal. This gets us back to the sin question. What precisely is your condition? He was in the same one. If sinful mortals on our earth are promised godhood on condition of repentance and living the gospel, and this is the path all gods have traveled, then it follows that most, if not all, gods once were mortal sinners. I have Mormons say to me, well, don't you believe in the power of forgiveness? And I tell them, yes, but I will always forever eternally be a forgiven sinner. It will never be said of me that I am eternally holy. And when we read about God, in the Bible, we're reading about a deity who's always been holy. That's his nature. But in Mormonism, every god, every man is, has to achieve holiness. However, when we turn to the Bible, we encounter a god of holiness without any equals. In 1 Timothy 2, 2 we read, There is no one holy like the Lord. Indeed, there is no one beside you. There is no, not any rock like our God. So when the Bible says there is no one holy like the Lord, it means that. There are not billions of gods in the universe that have overcome sin and arrived at holiness. I find that many Mormons think of these different qualities of God as though these are things that you could acquire, like if you go to college and you study real hard, you could be all-knowing in physics or something, and 20 guys could all get PhDs in physics. Uh, but it's not the same when you're talking about holy. There, there's not a course for becoming holy. <laughs> uh, God calls us to holiness, but we're always forgiven sinners. It's never our nature or our a description of us in our actual uh, being of holiness. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 11, for who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid for from him and through him and to him are all things to him be glory forever. In Revelations 15 4 we read, who shall not fear thee O Lord and glorify thy name for thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgment, judgments are made manifest. Notice that. 
Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name, for thou only art holy. And when it says only, it means that there is one eternal holy God who has never been less than he is today. To say that sinful man may attain to the same level of holiness as God and to be creator in the same sense is contrary to everything that we read in the Bible. The LDS view of God reminds me of Paul's statement in the first chapter of Romans. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible, the immortal God for images made like unto a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. The LDS view of God reduces him to one of an eternal line of mortal men who have achieved godhood. Speaking at the October 1969 LDS conference, Sterling W. Sill explained, it is helpful for us to remember that God, angels, spirits, and men are all the same species in different stages of development and in various degrees of righteousness. And when you take this view, then it makes sense to you that men can become gods because God was a human on some other world and he became a god. And uh, in their view, angels are just men who've had an earth experience. And devils are men who went astray and fell off uh, the perfection train. But they're all the same species. This robs God of his holiness, his uniqueness, of, of giving him praise, of seeing him worthy of worship. When I talk with Mormons about worshiping God, they have a hard time with this concept because they think in terms of, oh, well, that's like worshiping my stake president or something. Because they have this low view of God, it doesn't say, set, set right with them to think in terms of, oh, we're going to sit around all day and worship Jesus up there in heaven or something. And I said, well, it, that's because you don't understand how great a thing he did for you. <laughs> Once you grasp that you are a sinner in need of God's grace and he freely offered that to you, then it becomes a wonderful thing and you want to be in his presence. And it isn't um, an ego trip for God to call us to worship him because he's worthy of worship. Men are not worthy of worship. We all know leaders who have failed us. God never fails, so he's worthy of that praise. When we turn to the Bible, we read in Psalms 119, your righteousness is everlasting and your law is true. And Micah says, I, the Lord, do not change. So it's an everlasting holiness. The psalmist declares, before the mountains were born or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. When Christians speak of God as omnipotent or all-powerful, they are not meaning God has achieved all power due to overcoming obstacles and arriving at perfection, but that by definition, he alone has all power. He didn't achieve it. How then are we to understand each of these gods in the Mormon universe as becoming all-powerful? If our God can say he's all-powerful, all and yet there are billions of other gods out there who equally say they're all-powerful, then the word loses meaning. Only one can have all power. If you got all the cookies in the house, there aren't more cookies. When you encounter, we encounter the same problem with the LDS claim that their God is all-knowing. Yet each prior God is considered to be all-knowing as well. The very de definition of the words omnipotent and omniscient preclude countless gods achieving the same attributes. Only one can have all power and all knowledge. Not only was the Mormon God once a human on another world, he also has a wife. This would be necessary in order for him to advance to godhood and to procreate all the future spirits to be sent to his world. 
remember that in Mormonism, they believe in a pre-earth life and all of us were supposedly spirit children, literally born to God and his wife who have resurrected physical bodies. They birthed us all as spirits. Then we were sent to earth to be born as physical beings. So we had another set of parents who actually are brother and sister, by the way. It's a little confusing. Um, anyway, it's going on. The 2009 LDS Manual Gospel Principles explains that we were all born in a pre-earth life to heavenly parents. Quote, when we lived as spirit children with our heavenly parents, our heavenly father told us about his plan for us to become more like him. So this eternal plan, this plan of salvation goes on world after world after world. Uh, Brigham Young once said, every world has a tempter and every world has a savior. All of that diminishes from the uniqueness of what Jesus did for us and who God is. <clears throat> also in the 2010 LDS Manual Gos Doctrines of the Gospel, we read, all men and women are in the similitude of the universal father and mother and are literally the sons and daughters of deity. Since Mormonism teaches that we were literally born to heavenly parents in a pre-mortal existence, they interpret Bible verses referring to us as children of God in a very literal way. Joseph Smith taught that the inhabitants of the world are begotten sons and daughters of God. And that's from the Doctrine and Covenants, section 76. Thus, the LDS believe we were literally born to our heavenly parents as spirit beings in a prior existence, therefore making us begotten children of God. And so their Doctrine and Covenants says that we are begotten sons and daughters of God. But the Bible speaks of God as our Father in a figurative sense. In the New Testament, we are told that we become children of God through faith, not a literal birth in a premortal life. It is a spiritual adoption. John wrote, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Notice it was to those that believed that he gave the right. It is not something that is intrinsically ours. We are not by nature God's literal spirit children. Paul wrote, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. We are adopted into the family. On the other hand, Lorenzo Snow, the fifth president of the LDS Church, and he's the one that made up the little uh, statement, as man is, God once was, as God is, man may become. Same guy. He says, we have a mother in heaven. We are the offspring of God. He is our father, and we have a mother in the other life as well. The Mormon description of the Godhead as being the father, son, and Holy Ghost fails to explain the role of Heavenly Mother. Some Mormons have tried to rectify this by speculating that when they speak of God, it includes Heavenly Mother. But this would seem to relegate Heavenly Mother to a silent partner. Yet this is supposedly the role that all LDS women are to strive for. So when a Mormon says, we believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, they are leaving out a fourth member of the Godhood. They're leaving out the Mother God. And she was important because she gave birth to all of us. <laughs> and yet she gets no press, uh, hardly any mention. Once in a while, they'll have an article that'll talk about our heavenly parents. But they're very careful how often they use Heavenly Mother because they know that's a hard thing for outsiders to accept and deal with. Although there is an article now in their essays on their website about Heavenly Mother. Today, the LDS Church teaches that an eternal temple ceiling to your spouse is a requirement for exaltation to Godhood. If we are to take these ceilings literally, then on the day of the resurrection, many men will receive multiple wives to be their partners in eternal procreation. Brigham Young, second president of the LDS Church, declared, the only men who become gods, even the sons of God, are those who enter into polygamy. Joseph Smith was sealed to at least 34 women. Brigham Young had over 50 women sealed to him. Even today, the president of the church, Russell M. Nelson, that just became their president, has been sealed to two women in the temple, 
and is looking forward to achieving exaltation with both women at his side. I might also mention the same for Dallin Oaks, who is next in line to Nelson. If Nelson, Nelson who's 93, uh, when he dies, Oaks will take his place. But Oaks, as well, was a widower and remarried. And so when Mormons say to me, oh, polygamy is a dead issue, it's not a belief or practice anymore, I said, well, you may not practice it now, but it's a belief. Because all these men that had these women sealed to them assumed they would all be theirs truly in the resurrection for them as they went on to godhood. This was a case in my own family. My grandpa outlived my grandma. He went to the Mormon retirement home up by uh, the temple uptown and met an old spinster school lady, real nice lady named Effie. And uh, he got sealed to her in the temple. And so according to my Mormon family, all three are dead now. And so the three of them are a tr trinity, I guess you say, uh, uh, going off to create the spirits for their worlds. It is not a dead doctrine. It's just a, a delayed doctrine. The Bible declares that God acted alone in creation. There was nothing to indicate that he had a deified wife at his side. When we read in Isaiah 44, 24, it says, this is what the Lord says, your redeemer who formed you in the womb. I am the Lord, the maker of all things, who stretches out the heavens, who spreads out the earth by myself. The word is clear, God acted alone. There was no wife at his side. Now, PowerPoint five, which is we believe. This is uh, James E. Talmadge, who's talking on the doctrine of God progressing from a mortal God to a God. We believe in a God who is himself progressive, whose majesty is intelligence, whose perfection consists in eternal advancement a being who has attained his exalted state by a path which now his children are permitted to follow, whose glory it is their heritage to share, in spite of the opposition of the sex in the face of direct charges of blasphemy, the church proclaims the eternal truth. As man is, God once was. As God is, man may be. However, in Isaiah we read, with whom will you compare me or count me equal? To whom will you liken me that we may be compared? I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Mormons generally have a lot of, a high regard for the book of Isaiah because there's chapters of it quoted in the book of Mormon. Somehow they miss the last part of the book. <laughs> Because if you read chapters uh, 43 to, what, 47, through that section, you will find repeatedly this concept that there is only one, one God, never been any others. God's never been less than he is today. He is the almighty God. So in conclusion, I've tried to simplify this into a little graph for you. So on the Bible side... Reducing it all down, there is one eternal God who is spirit, who is singular. He is the only God. But in Mormonism, they believe in multiple progressive gods, each with a resurrected body, each with a wife. He, God, our God is holy, all-knowing, all-powerful, but the Mormon God had to achieve that holiness, had to study to gain all knowledge. I don't know how he would gain power, but they believe that that was something that increased for him. And finally, the God of the Bible has no wife. The Mormon God has at least one, and possibly many. In fact, one Mormon scholar once quipped that the reason the Mormons don't pray to Heavenly Mother is they aren't sure which one it would be. Uh, and that's an aside. I mean, their, their regular manuals don't get into these kind of discussions. <laughs> Years ago, when I was a Mormon and began to study the Bible and LDS literature, I came to a point where I had to make a choice. Who do I believe? Will I trust the God of the Bible or the words of LDS leaders? Last line. 
Thousands of years ago, Joshua declared, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Like Joshua, I have chosen the God who has always existed, who has never changed, the Holy One of Israel, the great I Am, the one who spoke and the universe sprung into existence. Thank you. Keep in mind, this is a question and answer. Is this mic on and now? Yeah. Um, so, in other words, um, this is not your stage, to, your platform to show off all of your knowledge. This is Sandra's time to, to answer the question. So please keep it to a question and let Sandra give the answer. Sound good? Um, if you need to leave at this time, of course, you're free to do so. You're free to leave at any time. Um, and I just wanted to point out, in case anybody leaves, um, does everyone know where Sandra is Monday to Friday, her, book, her bookstore? Yes. The Utah Lighthouse Ministries Bookstore. Your website is www.utlm.org. Right. And uh, uh, her bookstore is open uh, Monday to Friday. Monday to Saturday. Monday Monday through Friday, 10 to 5, and Saturday afternoons, 1 to 5. Yeah. That's right across, literally across the street from the East Stadium. We're across from first base. <laughs> <laughs> so. yep. Sometimes they hit the bell balls. And yeah. <laughs> All right. Question. Men, we're here. Question. Yeah. I'd like to ask you how you came way the Bible is worthy as opposed to the Mormon leaders that you've gone up with? Well, it's been around a lot longer than them, for one thing. For Mormonism to be true, there has to be validity in the Bible. It isn't a matter of saying, do I choose Christianity, the Bible, or do I choose Mormonism? Mormonism cannot be true without the Bible because it plagiarizes it all through their scriptures. So that in itself, in a sort of way, backs up the Bible because it's used so much in their own scriptures. So then you go back to the Bible, and when I look at that, as opposed to the Book of Mormon, I see a book that is history. Doesn't mean we know where every city was, and I can't explain everything in the Old Testament, but we have enough archeological evidence to show the existence of the people involved in the majority of the main cities. We have artifacts, we have uh, manuscripts, we have all sorts of evidence for this culture that the Bible claims to be talking about. That doesn't mean I can prove anything about the flood, but we have enough there to show that it's a record of real people in real time. And the preservation of the documents is astounding. When you have like the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls finding the, um, all the books of the Old Testament except, what is it, uh, Esther? Um, and the book of Isaiah is practically the same as our Isaiah today. It speaks to the preservation of the documents. In the New Testament, the earliest record we have of anything about Christianity is from the Bible text. Well, other than Josephus and that, but I mean, it's the, the record was not changed by the Catholics or some later groups of people because we have documents that predate any ecclesiastical control over the manuscripts. So I believe that we can have confidence there really was a Jesus. He really said the things that he said, that the New Testament has faithfully preserved that word. Then you have to make the decision by faith whether you can believe the story. It uh, doesn't prove he, that God raised Jesus from the dead, but I believe the record shows a valid history 
of the events of the day. Clearly, the early Christians absolutely believed Jesus rose from the dead. What they uh, suffered in proclaiming that is astounding, and their ability to go forth in a very hostile world and proclaim that somebody rose from the dead. I mean, you can imagine if, uh, if all of us went out and started telling Salt Lake, oh, they just raised some guy from their congregation from the dead. You know, you'd say, oh, yeah, sure. Uh, you'd think they, they have a bunch of crazy people down at that church. It wasn't any different then. People knew when you died, you died. Uh, this was not an easy thing for people to accept. I think one of the um, interesting things in the record for the New Testament is that if you were going to have men invent this story, I don't think you would invent it in this way. So that in a Jewish culture, think Muslim culture because it was much the same on the attitude towards women, if you were making up the story, would you have women be the first to see Jesus? Would you have women run back to tell the apostles, hey, he's risen? It's not the story, if you're making it up, this isn't the story you'd make up. And there are things that, like that in it that say to me, I can accept and trust this record. And then, yes, there is a point at which you have to commit to belief because it can't take you all the way. I can't give you a, a video of the resurrection, but I believe there is sufficient evidence for me to trust it. Questions? Just raise them. In 1983, I moved to Salt Lake City, Utah. Your book, Mormonism, Shadow of Reality, was the very first book I put, I bought at that time. It was the very first book I bought that opened my eyes. And so my question to you, we, start, we started writing that book when we got married in 1959. <laughs> uh, Gerald started doing research and he was just typing up little freebie papers we were handing out to everybody. And then we decided that this was kind of inefficient to keep typing the same stuff up all the time. And I made the famous last word statement to him I know how to run a mimeograph machine. And uh, there you are. <laughs> so we went down to Sears and bought a mimeograph and uh, started typing up the research. And so it just grew. First, it was our own research. And then our family said we were nuts. And so we started uh, getting more research to show them, no, I mean, it's not just one quote. This is a problem throughout the church history. And look, here's this quote, this quote, and this quote. And so, uh, then our families uh, shut us down, <laughs> and so then we start trying on our friends, and uh, pretty soon they shoot you down. Uh, but then finally we started finding people that were interested in what we were writing up, and it just grew. And so there was a 63 version of our Mormonism book, there was a 64, a 72, uh, an 81, an 87, <laughs> and so it just kept going. But it has been a very long lifetime of research, uh, yeah, At, which makes it kind of humorous in some ways. I get people, uh, once in a while, a Mormon will come into the store, and a Mormon will say to me, Mrs. Tanner, I just want to ask you, have you ever really read the Book of Mormon? <laughs> and I ask them, which edition? Uh, <laughs> so, yes, I've read it several times. <laughs> I marked all the changes. <laughs> so. Any other yeah. questions? Hi, Senator. I moved here a couple years ago from the Bible Belt, so this is all new to me <laughs> and eye opening. Um, one thing that I've had uh, with people that work for me, I've had a few that have died and gone to their funerals and, and heartbroken by the story of their families are forever and this, uh, you know, the, as they go on. I just don't know how to talk to them. And, you know, if I go into that, it would be almost heartless, you know, as far as trying to explain uh, what God thought about what heaven is and what heaven isn't, and I just, can you give me any advice to that? Well, I don't think you start there. You, you start with 
a little simpler approach of uh, things that just come up in daily conversation, things you're wondering about, questions about Mormonism, things you didn't understand. Um, that because you have, it's like putting WD-40 on rusted gears. It takes a while to work that through and get the gears to start moving. And um, that's the process. It's a long process. It is not, bam, uh, give them 10 photocopies and they're out. Well, it almost was that simple for me, but, uh, but it generally is not that simple because most people won't look at anything. If they would be willing to look, it's not hard to show them problems. The average Mormon is content, or even if he's not content, he still believes it's true. So it's a gentleness of uh, asking questions, trying to get them to start thinking about uh, the logical consequences of stuff. Um, for instance, with Nelson, the new prophet, he just went in, and uh, he'll be sustained at the April conference. Um, you know, I, th I think all of you could ask any friend, oh, I read about your new prophet. How does that work with the, that he's sealed to two women? <laughs> uh, but just so, you're just trying to get him to think. Shameless plug. Uh, in June, a new book's coming out that a number of us in ministry have written chapters for on how to start conversations with Mormons. Sandra, can I respond to that question a little yeah. bit? Yeah. Need a mic. Wait a minute. Sorry. I disobeyed a little. <laughs> Barbara's an old friend, so she gets a pass. Climb along. Little stair. And I think you, did you know her? I don't remember. <laughs> that was a while ago. <laughs> we came to Utah in 1949 as missionaries to the Mormons. The way she was saved, who asked that question? You did. Um, she, she decided that us kids, eight, six, and eight, and ten, you know, needed to go to Sunday school. So she sent us down to a little church in the community, and she thought she'd better go down and see what they're teaching us, because we didn't like the Mormon church. Anyway, she would talk to the pastor about Mormonism, and his response would be, Lily, I don't know anything about Mormonism, but I know Jesus and I know the Bible. And I think and so that's that's the basic thing. You don't have to know Mormonism to be like Sandra does or um, to be able to reach them. And she when we came to Utah and her, her she would say the best way to start with them is get them to question in their own mind. And let them start doing some research on their own. But yeah. always have your biblical answer. Yeah. I promise not to interrupt. <laughs> okay. We have other questions. Oh, Tom, I want one down here. <coughs> wait, wait for the mic. They'll never hear you. Uh, John Huntsman died uh, just this week, and uh, I know he was a good Mormon. Mm -hmm. And my question is now that he's dead, how does he, what's his Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes. Well, uh, in the Mormon scheme of things, when you die, you go to one of two places, a uh, spirit prison or paradise, awaiting the resurrection of your body. And so, by Mormon standards, huntsmen would have gone to paradise, a good place. And um, those that die outside of Mormonism go to spirit prison. And then the Mormons believe that they will send missionaries from paradise to the people in spirit prison. So a huntsman may be looking forward to being a missionary and going down to spirit prison to teach Mormonism. Uh, and then uh, they believe that they're preaching the gospel there to those people, but in order for the people they preach to to come back up into their level of paradise, they have to wait for someone here on earth to do their temple work for them. And so all the Mormons going to the temples are going to get baptized or sealed in the temple to someone that's dead in hopes that their relative is one of those people in spirit prison that heard huntsmen or whoever come teach them as missionaries and they said, oh, yeah, I want to be a Mormon. Good, wait. Well, when someone's going to do your temple work for you, and then you get to move up to paradise. 
Okay, so then comes the millennial reign of Christ. And during that, the Mormons believe that uh, all the good Mormons that couldn't find a mate will have a chance then to find a mate of the others that are there that qualified and didn't find a mate. So it's going to be a big matchmaking thing uh, to get all the Mormons married to whomever. Um, and to finish all the temple work for all the people that want to be Mormons that didn't get baptized or married in the temple yet. So they got a thousand years to take care of everybody. Then comes the judgment and the resurrection of everyone. And uh, at the judgment, you either go to outer darkness or to one of the three levels of heaven, which is telestial, terrestrial, celestial. Mormons go to the celestial. You guys will probably make it to the terrestrial. I'm probably looking at telestial. Uh, I don't qualify for Son of Perdition or Outer Darkness, although some Mormons are sure I do, but I was never married in the temple, and so I get a pass. <laughs> uh, you've got to really, really be a good Mormon and move away from it in order to be bad enough to have a second death. So the moral of the story is, don't worry about joining the Mormon church now, save your tithing money, and you gotta, they'll do the work for you after you die. <laughs> So, a young man and woman get uh, sealed in the temple, and the husband dies, and so the wife remarries, and she's sealed in the temple. Yeah. Well, not necessarily. But she, cannot, she cannot have two sealings. Well, that's what I was curious about, is because if, if a man can have two wives, yeah. can a wife have two husbands? Because it doesn't, it doesn't move forward the plan of procreation. It doesn't speed up the ability to have all the spirits you need for your world. It only helps if a man has more women, he can have more children to make his world. The woman can't have any more kids having two husbands than she would have had with one. So economically, there is no reason for her to have a second mate. That's the theory. Um, so a woman that does uh, outlive her husband she was sealed to, for her to be sealed to another man, she would have to have a cancellation of the sealing to the first. And depending on the situation, she may not be able to get that cancellation from the first guy because if her husband died a very faithful good Mormon, there would no, be no reason to break the sealing. And this gets into the complication of if they already had children, uh, for her to get unsealed from the first guy and married to the second guy, it tears up the family on who they're going to be with in the afterlife. Are the kids going to be with the dad that uh, got put out or uh, with the new father who isn't really their father? So this whole eternal progression thing gets a little messy on trying to figure out who's going to be sealed to whom. Anyways, okay. Some women do have two ceilings on the books, and uh, there are different reasons that can happen. But when you ask them, well, how does it work out? They say, oh, well, we don't worry about that because God will work it all out. And you get all kinds of problems of whose kids are going to be with which parents, and they say, oh, well, we don't need to worry about it. God's going to work it all out. And I said, well, if he can work it all out, then why don't we just leave it all alone and let him work it all out, and we wouldn't have to do all the temple work. <laughs> But there are things that they don't have answers for because it gets really, really confusing on family lines. When there's divorce, remarriage, parents that have yours, mine, and ours kind of family situations because the kids go with the sealed parent, uh, the faithful, good, sealed parent. So it gets sticky, yeah. The sealing of men to men back before the 1900 time period was a sealing of adoption of men being sealed as sons to prominent Mormon men. Because if you thought that your goal to become a god would be furthered by hooking you with 
a big star that's going to get to maybe exaltation faster, you'd want to get sealed to him as his son. Instead of staying with your dad that's only got one wife, you could be sealed to Brigham Young that's got 50 something and he's going to get to be a god first. So, because he can have more spirit kids. And so you'd want to get sealed to him. But they no longer seal men to men. Uh, they said you're to all be sealed to your own parents and not seek out leaders of the church to be sealed to. But for a while, that was the program. Okay, I think we're about done. I can't stand up anymore. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. I'm going to let the pastor come up and close. <clears throat>